Amen. You guys can be seated. Did my heart very good to hear you sing, to worship with you today, start our new year. I'm Matt. I'm, uh, if you're new here, I'm usually one of the worship musicians up here. I was joking with my friend Jason before the service that when he did not work here, he used to come and preach this time of the year all the time. And now that he's working here, he's nowhere to be found. <laughs> and here I am. So always a privilege to open the word with you guys. Uh, I hope your Christmas was full of warmth and light and love and cookies and the Jim Carrey Grinch and the one present that you really wanted. And instead of sledding, it was probably golf or tennis last week, going to the park in short sleeves. It was a lovely week for April or October, but <laughs> my northern roots still can't separate cold weather and snow from Christmas. It's still a struggle for me, I hear you. The Rexford Christmas was full of warmth and light and love and cookies and severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus too. Uh, also known as COVID, the 2019 edition. So everybody but myself and Harvey went down. Harvey's still doing good. Aw. So we did miss our extended family gatherings. We missed our, our normal traditions, but I know I've heard from a lot of other families who had the same thing. We counted our blessings to be together. Uh, the blessing of everybody having it at the same time so we could come out of our rooms and the blessing of, of wonderful community who brought us dinner every night and, and prayed for us. So seriously, I know it's another flare right now. It's another variant in the world. So prayers for all of you working in healthcare, prayers for all of you uh, have dealt with COVID or are dealing with it now, maybe even suffered loss in the past year. It is a continual, endless curveball to us, is it not? So it's not easy, but guys, it's 2022. I am ready, I'm ready for robot cars. I'm tired, I'm tired of driving myself around like it's 1982, all right? Let's get this going. I can't wait to get in my car and watch a show and then get out of my car and be where I'm gonna be. Won't that be awesome? Who am I kidding? I will get in my car and take a nap and get out and be where I wanna be. That's what I'm gonna do with my robot car. So one cool thing for free is I was researching the future this is unrelated to anything in the message, but I found this in an article. Forest fires could one day be dealt with by drones that would direct loud noises at the trees below. Since sound is made up of pressure waves, it can be used to disrupt the air surrounding a fire, essentially cutting off the supply of oxygen. Isn't that cool? At the right frequency, the fire simply dies out. Apparently, bass frequencies work best. So hopefully one day soon, a bunch of drones are gonna fly over a forest fire and just go, bah. and the fire's gonna go out. That's the future, everybody. That is cool. I have one more weird thing to start. I would like to give you a choose your own adventure, okay? Today it's gonna be pastor accessory version glasses. I have these understated blue glasses. They're small, they're probably not gonna distract you. I also have these that are straight from like the 1970s. I got these on Zenny Optical, got a new batch in. Some people like them, some people wonder what I'm doing with my life. <laughs> so, if you'd like to vote for the understated blue pair, please raise your hands. A few, mature among you. Uh, who would like to vote for the fun brown ones? Mm. I kind of set that up, but where you... So the blue ones had like a 10 or 15 minute message, but the brown ones have a full length 48 minute message. So. You guys picked it. I'm sorry, this is too bad. All right, to start out this new year of 2022, we are going to do a seven-week series on our core values. Another way to describe these might be the primary characteristics of the life that we want to develop, the values that we hold as vital to reflecting how Jesus lived. And here's why we're doing this. Here's why we even try to identify these values as targets. Uh, we want to understand more clearly how to passionately pursue life and mission with Jesus. What does it look like? And we want to know what living as a follower of Jesus looks like practically in our daily lives. So these seven values are, if you're unfamiliar or need a reminder, they are enjoying God, loving others, understanding scripture, 
depending on the Spirit, living in integrity, magnifying grace, and advancing the gospel. <clears throat> and we're going to do a week on each one of those. Now, a quick aside on sermon notes before we begin, okay? Some of you are looking at the app right now, and you're freaking out. You're going, where are the sermon notes, Matt? Well, let me explain. Over the next seven weeks, we're going to try something different wherein we do not provide any sermon notes. Collective gasp on three. One, two, three. <gasps> Can you believe it? Here's the reasoning, and if you still hate it afterward, you're going to be okay, all right? We believe that preaching is primarily a proclamation of God's truth, and it's to be an interaction with God's spirit through his word. So while note-taking can be effective to help us stay engaged, it helps us remember things later, there may also be a side to it that puts us into lecture mode, or it treats the message as primarily education, primarily transmission of knowledge. Does that make sense? So we want you to be attentive during the sermons to where the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, where he's pressing a point into you. Those are the things we invite you to write down, to think about later during the week. So we're not against taking notes. I'm not, I've got notebooks full from our wonderful book studies through the years that I look through. But we're going to try something new with this familiar values series and evaluate it and see what comes of it. So my proposal is if you're a note taker, keep the page handy still. But just write down moments where you're especially moved or impressed by the Spirit with, with what's being said. Like, that's something I need to keep thinking about and pressing into. And at the end of each of these seven messages, we're going to give you just a minute of silence to listen to the Spirit and to write down your main takeaways from those messages that you can think of through the week. So that's what we're doing. Sound good? All right, our first value that we are tackling is enjoying God. Try to hear those two words together in a fresh way. Enjoying God. Maybe that sounds strange to some of you, like, are you really supposed to enjoy God? Like, we can enjoy a lot of the good things that he puts in our life, but how do you enjoy God himself? We're talking about the creator of all things. You can't see him or touch him. He's so incredibly beyond anything we imagine him to be. How do you enjoy his presence like you enjoy being with a friend? Is that even possible? Is that really even appropriate? Well, have you ever noticed that it's more difficult to make a decision when there's a ton of options before you? One of my favorite things to do is to eat at restaurants. You can almost put it in my hobby category. My wife and I love to go out together. We love to go out with friends. She's not a big fan of fast food establishments. However, I am not snobby or picky. I see the beauty in all restaurants, okay? <laughs> I'm a fan of Arby's. I think curly fries rule. I'm a fan of Chick-fil-A. I had waffle fries yesterday, I'll admit. Uh, there's McDonald's little straight salty fries, and then you have Red Robin's big crispy steak fries, and then you go to Wendy's, and they have this new hot and crispy guarantee. I may have a little bit of a fry problem. So my New Year's resolution, I'm going to cut down to eight times a week for fries, all right? <laughs> you guys, you hold me accountable to that. So anyway, the fast food menu is pretty simple. You got like combos one through ten. You can get a salad, you get a Frosty, you're out of there. Maybe on the other end of the, of the spectrum, you go to a, a finer establishment like Sobeys or Hall's Chop House, just wonderful food, but it's usually a smaller menu, right? You get the trout, the filet, the duck confit, you got the four different sides. You can tell that I love food, can you not? It's easier to make a decision when you have a smaller menu, right? But I find that at places where probably the chief offender is Cheesecake Factory, where the menu is 12 pages long. Have you been there recently? They bring it to you like in a wheelbarrow, like here, here's your menu. So many choices, very difficult to make a decision. When you have a multitude of options, it's more difficult to choose. So many times it can feel this way about what God wants from us. What is God's highest priority for us in our relationship with him? Is it, is it a menu of options that he, he hands us and he's like, well, for your life you could serve me or you could work for me with a side of obey me, maybe you could fear me, and then for dessert, why don't you uh, love me, or live morally, love others, give generously, like what is it that God really wants the most? Are some of us made to be fearers? 
some of us made to be servers, and we leave like the emotional and the artist people to be the touchy-feely enjoyers. Well, somebody asked Jesus a similar question many years ago, and we're going to look at that together in Mark chapter 12. Turn to the Gospel of Mark in the New Testament. Chapter 12, if you have a rare paper copy there or in your phone, Mark chapter 12. This is an interesting exchange. This is one of the question and answer sessions that the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the religious leaders, they're putting on to trap Jesus in some inconsistency. And I love picturing this scene and the wisdom of our Savior. So already in this passage, just a little background, some wise guys, he's come up, he's asked insincere question number one, which was, teacher, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar? And Jesus is like, give me a coin. Who's on this coin? And they're like, Caesar. And so he says that famous line, well, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. And they're mystified at the great answer. And it's not included in the Gospels, but I think Jesus probably added a boom roasted at the end. Like, gotcha. So the next insincere guy steps up. The next guy trying to trap him says, well, Jesus, suppose that there's seven brothers who they died in succession but they all married the same woman. Like, who are they going to be married to in heaven? I love that question came from the Sadducees who don't even believe in the resurrection. And I think Jesus was well within his rights to say, dumb question, who's next? But he doesn't. He answers them brilliantly. Boom, roasted number two. And so on the heels of those two questions comes our passage. There's this third guy. He's a scribe. And from reading the passage, I think this man really was seeking truth. He wasn't trying to trap Jesus. He heard the wisdom of Christ, and he wanted to know. So later Jesus says about this man, you are not far from the kingdom of God. So that leads us to our passage. Join me in verse 28, or it'll be on the screens. It says this, one of the scribes came and heard them arguing and recognizing that he, Jesus, had answered them well, asked him, well, what commandment is the foremost of all? Basically, he's asking, hey, what's the most important thing to do with my life? What's the most important thing to follow? So Jesus answered, the foremost is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Now, that's probably a familiar passage, but let's try to look at it again with fresh eyes if we could. First of all, what does Jesus start with in his answer? It sounds kind of unrelated to our modern ears. The guy asks, what's the most important commandment? Jesus starts with, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And then he launches into the, what we know is the great commandment. So what is that first phrase all about? Well, this phrase that he began with is called the Shema. Everybody say Shema. Shema. It was a confession of faith. It was a creed that a faithful Jewish person would say every morning and every evening. In fact, Jewish boys were taught this passage from Deuteronomy almost as soon as they could talk. So kind of a neat thought that this was probably one of Jesus' first phrases or words that he said as well. And this came to be comprised out of three different parts of Deuteronomy, and it basically declared this. There is one God. He is unique above all others, and we are called to love him and obey his commandments. That was the Shema. So here's the interesting part. Jesus started with this Shema to all the very faithful Jews who kept the laws so carefully, and that would have triggered something in them something so familiar. So he started with something they knew well, just like Jesus to meet us on our turf, no matter who we are. So the flow is this, he says, a reminder and a proclamation about God. Remember, he is the one true and unique God. Thus, the, create, the greatest command is to love him supremely. And then he expands the call to love God with loving others which we're gonna talk about more in depth next week. 
So you know he had, he had 613 laws and commandments to, to choose from. He could have talked about keeping the Sabbath or not coveting, don't steal, don't murder, picked a bunch of them, but no. Jesus chose the being, the feeling, over all of the doing to emphasize the greatest commandment because he knew that the doing flows out of the being. Another way to say it, Jesus knew if your priority of loving the Lord your God with everything you are was in order, then you would want to serve him, obey him, and fear him correctly. So when this religious scholar asked Jesus to boil it down, what God is most interested in, he responds not to obey and fear, although God is certainly worthy of that. He doesn't say serve and work for, although we should, but the foremost call is to love the Lord your God with all you have. This is what is at the heart of enjoying God, is a delight in who God is and the relationship you share. This doesn't mean the other things aren't necessary and right. It's just that they aren't the main thing. And I hope all, all the kids in here today, all the students will hear this and know this from a young age, that God's highest priority for you is to love him, to be captivated and taken with him, and then everything else flows out of that. Then when we obey him, when we serve him, it becomes a service that flows from a cheerful, captivated heart, not an obligation. To merely do religious things without a heart caught up in God is, in the words of Jesus, hypocrisy. So whatever else may be going on in your life as a Christian, if there is not a willing and sincere, passionate and joyful love for God, then you're missing what God wants most for you and from you. Do you start to feel a little annoyed when you hear that? Like it almost doesn't seem fair, does it? Like we're, we can say, God, I'm, well, I'm serving I'm fellowship kids. I go down to Piedmont Women's Center twice a month. I read my Bible. I'm, I'm here on a, a rainy Sunday in early, in early January. Like you can't really call me to have emotional feelings towards you, right? That doesn't seem right. Well, let's apply it to your children or your significant other, or you could apply it up to your parents if your kid's here today. What if they did everything you asked, everything for you? What if they did chores or they gave you gifts at holidays, but in your interaction with them, there was no joy, no smile, no sign of enjoying your presence? How would that feel to you? God deeply loves us. He's, he's made us his children. He's adopted us into his family through faith in Christ. And his desire is that we respond and relate to him in love. This is 1 John 4, 19. We love him because he first loved us. Square one, God loved us to the point of giving his only son to rescue us. And our response can't simply be, I'll I'll give you a few dollars when I'm able and I'll, I'll go to small group when I'm not too busy. This, this kind of love demands a response. That is all that we are. In case you think this passage is maybe just like an outlier passage by itself, you could leaf through the Psalms. You could notice all the language of a heart that is caught up with God. I hope you saw that as we read through them last year. You could look at John uh, chapter 14 to 17 where Jesus further describes the closeness that he desires for his relationship with us. Vine, branches, abiding. Or, or Philippians, where Paul expresses the joy that he finds in Christ. All through the scriptures, we are told that we are created for a grace-saturated life of enjoying God. So what does it look like to enjoy God? Here's two very practical ideas for how this can become more and more of a reality in our daily lives. And the first thought is, enjoying God looks like delighting in what he has made. Direct your attention to the screens. Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. This beautiful world was made by God and given to us as a gift for enjoyment. 
And he could have created our environment any way that he wanted to. It could have looked more like Mars, you know, with a little more oxygen to breathe. Or it could have just been a gray landscape with no hills, no oceans. But he didn't do that. So open your eyes and look around again. Appreciate the changing leaves, the mountains, the rivers, the incredible detail of each part of creation was given to us to enjoy. Be amazed at his creatures. There's over 10,000 species of birds. There's baby giraffes and giant anteaters, fearsome tigers and killer sharks. There's elegant horses and the tiniest of insects. Over 900,000 types of insects, in fact. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. So watch a nature show. Be amazed at places that you've never even heard of and creatures in this world. <laughs> it's a special creature of God right there. Special. <laughs> God could have also created food with no taste. More of a functional paste or goo. Have you ever thought about that? But he did not, praises be. We could be eating porridge for breakfast, gruel for lunch, and oatmeal for dinner. But we have an ama- Oh my goodness, look at that. <laughs> You're dismissed. Let's get out of here. <laughs> we have a variety of amazingness to sample from the world. We have fried green tomatoes and shredded beef tacos. We can take a fish and slice it up really raw and make it into something called sushi. You should try that sometime. We can have a fall apple from up at Sky Top. Can have a donut from up at Sky Top. Yeah. Just what about milk? Without milk, there's no milkshakes. Without milk, there's no cheese. Without cheese, we would all be grumpy. So I'm getting excited for heaven because these things will be perfected. And I'm excited for lunch as well. So. so try something different in God's world. Take a couple more walks outside. Slow down enough to notice the sunset and the moon every now and then. Maybe put our phones down a little more. Enjoy God's world. Try a different food or beverage. Branch out. By enjoying his gifts, we give God glory if our enjoyment causes us to remember the giver. John Piper says this on the topic. If created things are seen and handled as gifts of God and as mirrors of his glory, they need not be occasions of idolatry if our delight in them is always also a delight in their maker. So let the ocean lead you to a thankful prayer and let the taste of a wonderful meal point you to the giver of all good things. Of all people, Christians should be the most in awe of this wonderful place with all of its gifts. That our great God can make all of this with the greatest of ease, with the words of his mouth, and then sustain it. So living this way doesn't limit enjoying God to times of corporate worship, although it's certainly a part of that, or, or mountaintop experiences, but by every good gift, we can experience him, and we can realize that it's from him and speaks of him. My second thought for application is that enjoying God looks like delighting in what God has done for us in Christ. This is a part of enjoying God. It's delighting in what God has done for us in Christ. You see, not only has God given us all good things to enjoy that we just saw, but more importantly, God has given us himself to enjoy through Christ. A quick rehearsal, first of the bad news we took God's good creation and rather than worship the God who gave all things to us, we decided we wanted to run things ourselves. Romans 1 describes it as worshiping and serving the creatures rather than the creator. So we still live in a world full of beauty and wonder, but now it's all been corrupted by sin. And we see sin and suffering and death everywhere because we went our own way apart from God. And we not only defiled the very good creation that God gave us, but we also messed up our relationship with God. 
Messed it up so badly that there was and there's nothing that we can do to make things right again. That's the terrible news. But now a rehearsal of the good, great news. God, in his infinite mercy and grace, God took on flesh in the person of Jesus. He lived a perfect life. He died the death that we deserve. He rose victoriously from the dead and he offers us forgiveness and life now and forever. And this life is not found by obeying and serving and following rules and rituals, but it's found through simple faith in what Jesus did for us. That's how we once again have close relationship with God. This is the gospel that saves us into life with God. It's the same gospel that keeps us, sanctifies us, and as we dwell on it more and more deeply, it is the gospel that produces joy in our hearts as we walk through life. So our view of God is, is gonna dominate everything about us. Our theology will bleed into all of our life. So we have to see God accurately as he has revealed himself in his word to enjoy our life with him. If our view of God is a stern judge and he's just waiting for us to break a law so he can smack us down, then we're gonna live in fear. We're gonna live in shame when we sin. We're not gonna enjoy God and his gifts. We'll just try to get through without getting seriously walloped, right? But the truth is that Christ stepped before the judge and he paid the penalty that you will ever owe for your sin. And that frees you up to live a life of joy with God. If our view of God is distant, he's a distant father, he kind of tolerates us, he isn't really interested in me that much, then we're gonna live our lives apart from him. We'll probably come to him only when we have a problem or a big mess to fix. And that's a sad life, not feeling as if God cares much about you. Well, that's not the truth about God either. He is revealed as a father who runs across the field to his prodigal children. He's the father who thinks of his children with loving thoughts that outnumber the grains of sand on the seashore. So we continually saturate ourselves in these truths of the gospel and our identity in Christ. Dwell on this often, believing this deep down, believing an accurate view of God leads to a life of true daily enjoyment of our relationship with him. That's why it's so important for us to be reading and meditating on his word together. So if I may do a quick commercial for our Bible reading plan for this upcoming year, we are planning on going back to the New Testament with a chapter per day, all right, we're starting in Matthew. The schedule is online. I believe there's some bookmarks around that you could find. And the creator of the CBR journal that we have been using for a few years they have actually tweaked their resource a little bit based on some feedback they've gotten and what they've learned. And they have a new and improved version called Seeing Jesus Together. It's a lovely little book. It's right out there in the commons area. It has a section that's gonna look very similar to the CBR. That's more for your private Bible reading time. And then it has a new section that'll help you reflect on the Sunday worship gathering if you so choose. Like maybe tonight when you go home, for a few minutes just helps you reflect back on this corporate experience and how we saw Jesus together. And then there's a third section, if you choose to use it, that you could see Jesus in community if you have a small group of friends that might wanna gather around a passage of scripture. So a couple optional things you could use in this new resource. But these new journals are available today out in the commons area. A suggested donation to help us cover the cost of those, but. Never let that stop you if you don't have it. Please stop by and check those out. Whether you use that or not, we do encourage you to gather a few friends and read the Bible together throughout the year. It's very simple. You read personally and then you share with the group what God has impressed on you for that day. It's not rocket science, but it continually challenges us, continually inspires and motivates us that our community is pressing on to read the scriptures together. Ultimately, there's no five or six easy steps to living a life of enjoying God. If I asked you how you enjoy your family or friends, you probably couldn't fully explain that to me. But enjoying God is a natural 
outflow of being loved and then loving in return. So back to my main point, at the heart of enjoying God is a heart that delights in who God is and the relationship you share. It's the result of accepting his grace, believing the outrageous love of God is shown to you and loving him in return. So if you hear this today and it's depressing, maybe it's convicting because you honestly don't feel like joy and love characterize your life with God. And honestly, I think we all feel that way at different points throughout the year. I have one simple starting place for you, and that's to ask for it. Whatever God intends for us, he empowers in our lives. So if you really believe that God is most interested in us feeling passionately for him and loving him in return, he wants to give us that joy. So if your relationship feels obligatory, feels stale, let's be desperate for new enjoyment of God this year. Let's ask, let's pray for him to give us an experience of delight so that we can love him the way that he desires us to. And he will grow the desire in our heart. Let's ask him to begin that process. Remember Philippians 2.13, it says, God is at work in you to will and to do his good pleasure. Meaning, he's at work to will, he's at work to give you the desire, and to do, to enable you to live a life of enjoying him. As I wrap it up, I'd recommend a book to you called Enjoying God by Tim Chester. Uh, he's a pastor and author from England. I enjoyed leafing through that this week as I prepared. In his first chapter, Tim points out the difference to us between union with God and communion with God. I'm not talking about the act of uh, bread and wine communion. I'm talking about commune meaning relationship with God. And he calls us to remember that our union with God is a one-way street of grace from him to us. We are united to God in Christ, not by our achievement. So if you can imagine our union as a line pointed straight down to us with an arrow only on one side. That's our union with God. However, our communion with God can depend largely on what we contribute to the relationship. It can affect our enjoyment and experience of God. So maybe on the communion side, imagine another arrow that has Arrows on both sides of the line, our communion and our union. Listen to this illustration from the book. Imagine two sons. Jack makes breakfast for his father every day, and they chat for half an hour while they eat it together. Later in the day, Jack and his father hang out together, flying a kite, playing football, reading a book. Meanwhile, Jack's older brother Phil is embarrassed by his father. Phil stays in his room all day with his music turned up loud. And on the rare occasions when Phil communicates with his father, it normally takes the form of dismissive grunts. Well, how many sons does the father have? The answer, of course, is two. And what did they do to become sons? Nothing. They were simply born as sons. But only Jack enjoys being a son. Only Jack experiences a good relationship with his father. So praying and reading your Bible won't make you more Christian. And not doing those things won't make you less of a Christian. Our status as God's children is a gift. That's our union. But how much we enjoy that communion depends on what we do. Paul neatly captured this dynamic when he said in Philippians, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Grasping this distinction between union and communion protects us from thinking our actions make all the difference on one hand and thinking our actions make no difference on the other hand. So if you identify with the brother who invests in and enjoys the relationship, keep it up. Don't get complacent. There's always more 
to discover and enjoy about the Father, Son, and Spirit. And if you feel like the other brother right now, here's the good news. Your union with your father is unbroken. You are still a son or daughter because it's not up to you. So you can go back into your father's room and you can say, Dad, I'm sorry I haven't talked to you much. I'm sorry I haven't listened to you much. I'm sorry I haven't enjoyed all the good gifts you've put all around me and realize they're from you. But I wanna figure out how to enjoy this relationship and how to love you well in return. As I was trying to drift off to sleep last night, my mind was drawn to eternity. And uh, I just had the thought that this value, enjoying God, is one of the few that will begin now and continue on into all of eternity. We'll enjoy and discover new things about God for all time. So until then, in this life, may God make us a people who are characterized by our joy and our delight in him. Just a natural outflow of being loved and then loving in return. I'd like to close with a blessing over you. I'm using the, the chapter titles of, of Chester's book, Enjoying God, as the language for this. So I just invite you to close your eyes and receive this, and then we'll take a moment of silent reflection for you to listen to the Spirit. In every pleasure, you can enjoy the Father's generosity. And in every hardship, you can enjoy the Father's formation. In every prayer, enjoy the Father's welcome. And in every failure, enjoy the Son's grace. In every pain, you can enjoy the Son's presence. And in every worship service and time of communion, enjoy the Son's touch. In every temptation, may you enjoy the Spirit's life. And in every groan, enjoy the Spirit's hope. In one another, may we enjoy God's love. And in daily repentance and faith, enjoy God's freedom. Let's continue in a moment of silent reflection to think over the sermon today. What is the Holy Spirit saying to you about your life of enjoying God? Take about 60 seconds. Feel free to write something down if you wish. And then we will respond with a song to close.